ora te wai, kei te ora te whenua, kei te ora te tangata. The water is healthy, the land and the people are nourished. I'd like to take you back to the beginning of time. In te ao Māori, rangi nui was torn away from Papa Tuanuku and darkness became light. But the disruptive parting caused the gods to fight. An army of insects descended on earth as a weapon for battle. Today, we need an army of insects to reduce the damage caused by sheep and cattle. Te aitanga pepeke means the insect world. Insects appear in many whakatauki, such as the little grub who destroys the pūriri tree. As a reminder, that even tiny things can have a huge impact. Aspiring pioneers and early settlers realised the potential of our landscape and introduced grass-grazing mammals. We have since become the world leaders in the agricultural industry. Today, we share our land with over 6 million dairy cows, 3 million cattle and 29 million sheep, collectively producing over 100,000 tonnes of dung per year but we didn't think of the impact it would have on our land, climate and water, such as surface runoff and degradation in water quality and soil. But sometimes a solution to our future can be found in our history. And so today I would like to introduce the environmental superhero of the 21st century. The humble dung beetle. He protects the earth, fights harmful emissions and, and pests, and asks for nothing more but a field of fresh poop. There are four types of beetles the movers and shakers. I call them the ballers and tunnelers. And those that prefer to lax out in their pads, the dung pad dwellers and kleptos. But the ones who can solve all our problems are the tunnelers. Now, this is the interesting stuff. Let me run through some key benefits, benefits that can mitigate the adverse effects on dung of pasture. Soil structure and function. Now, all of these little holes lead to increased aeration in the soil, allowing water to penetrate better and increase grass root growth and biological activity in the soil under the dung pads. Dung beetle activity therefore leads to reduced microbial contamination and runoff and better retention of dung and urine in the soil. Now, improving the soil has a flow-on effect. Improved water infiltration reduces surface ponding which means fertilisers are able to enter the upper soil profile and reduce the level of contaminants entering our waterways. But wait, there's more. By minimising forage fouling, you'll have more feed in your paddock. Dung burial enhances grass root growth through nutrient recycling and increases the amount of pasture available, improving long-term sustainable productivity. They can even reduce the numbers of pesky flies and parasitic worms. By destroying the eggs and young larvae of parasitic worms and by burying the dung before the flies have time to breed. These little guys can even reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The burial of animal waste and improved infiltration of urine into upper soils reduces the production of methane and nitrous oxide, and boom, we see a decrease in the emissions of greenhouse gases associated with animal waste. All of these benefits lead to, improved, lead to the improved of livestock farming, reduce agricultural input, boost productivity, and increase profit. So what are we waiting for? The importation of dung beetles and the benefits they provide are not just focused on the dairy industry, 
but are also equally beneficial to beef, sheep, horse, deer, and any other pastoral livestock. Now, I think it's time for some official introductions. These handsome guys are the forest-dwelling natives of New Zealand. We can thank them for keeping our forests clean. And these little beauties are the 11 species of imported dung beetles approved for release in New Zealand. We currently have six of them in our paddocks. I brought along some with me today <laughs> as well as the brood boards that they create in the soil. Now, the reason we need so many varieties is because dung beetles have seasonal periods. Just like us, some prefer the warmer climates and others do better in the cold. Some are morning risers and others are night owls. But it's important to note that each are habitat specific to open grasslands and feed exclusively on the dung produced by the herbivorous mammals. I can hear them now. Alarm bells ringing whenever we talk about introducing new species, and rightly so. There are some potential impacts that should be considered, such as one, the invasion of native habitats, two, out-competing native dung fauna, and three, the spread of animal and human disease. Now, adult dung beetles do not have any chewing mouth parts, and so are not capable of eating plant roots or any material that requires chewing. They will not survive in our New Zealand forests. Research was commissioned by the Ministry of Health, and results were, quote, in areas where the dung beetles became abundant, their activity reduced the transport of pathogens from ruminant dung on pasture to people, and they did not see a need to undertake any further research into the release of exotic dung beetles. So where to now? We have a release strategy that was approved in 2011 by ERMA, and dung beetles innovation have a commercial mass rearing farm in Kaipara, but to see measurable improvements, we need councils, farmers and communities on board to move from a single point release strategy to a mass release strategy. These guys are the only real low cost, self-sustainable, preventative solution to clean up our waterway pollutants from livestock pasture. But we need regional and national release strategies. We need to commit now, if the government is serious, about making 90% of our precious fresh water swimmable by 2040. Insects have been around since the beginning of time. They are pests, pollinators, and they can clean up our grime. But the humble dung beetle, aka Scarabaeoidea, is our environmental solution. An ingenious idea. Benefits? Soil, water quality, pasture productivity, nutrient recycling, and farming sustainability. Potential risks have been researched and tested, but for the beetles to thrive, we need everyone invested. A single dung beetle cannot act alone. We need an army of beetles to clean up our home. Kei te ora te wai, kei te ora te whenua, kei te ora te tangata. The water is healthy, the land and the people are nourished. Kia ora. So you're saying that the native dung beetles live in the forest and the exotic dung beetles are all in the pasture and never the two will meet? Um, no, because dung beetles are only habitat specific to open grasslands and so the, we have forest beetles that are able to chew through the plant roots and do their business there yep, but yep. these ones are specific to paddocks, open grasslands. But are they all exotic ones that are specific to the pastures? Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm saying we haven't got any native ones that we can put oh, in the pastures. No, no, no native dung beetles. Um, they, yeah, we have to introduce them to right. New Zealand. It, you know, today's dung beetle might be tomorrow's possum or cane toad, as in Australia. What makes you think that they won't just get over-enthusiastic? Shouldn't we wait for the Kaipara program to go along a few more years? Um, so it has been running for a few years, and they've also um, done it in Australia as well, but they are environmentally beneficial. So compared to rabbits, possums, I think they kind of do a completely different thing to, compared to what they do. So to be honest, I think that they're... Oh, they're beneficial for the water quality, for the soil, so I don't think it'll be like, it'll turn out like the possums and the rabbits. So All right. And can they it. coexist with um, animals on a pasture, you know, tromping around? Can um, the dung beetles survive with animals tromping around on yes, top of them? Yes, because they actually go into the soil. So they do all of their business, you know, make the brood balls, and then they actually bury tunnels into the soil, so they still, they will survive. They will survive. All yeah. right, thank you. No problem.